So what is being critiqued in the third vision in the second half of the book of Daniel, the third of four visions that are given? Uh, and one thing to remember is in chapter 4, we had the cultural prosperity of Nebuchadnezzar that was being critiqued. Babylon depicted as this prosperous, fruitful tree under which animals could take shelter and shade and they could lodge in the branches and you could eat of its fruit. And so the, ba the city of Babylon was depicted with its cultural growth and prosperity and a critique was level against it that it was sort of rotten, like a tree rotten in its, in its trunk in Nebuchadnezzar's attitude because he didn't recognize that God was the source of this prosperity and he didn't acknowledge God and therefore God disciplined him for seven years. So that was chapter four. So when we come over to chapter nine, uh, we expect that like in the other uh, chapters that mirror each other here throughout the book, uh, that chapter 9 will probably also have something similar in terms of its critique as we have seen you know how chapter 1 was about education and uh, and chapter two, 6 was about moral transformation and the two things are related so we expect these things to be related and it appears that what's going on in chapter 9 is in Daniel's actual prayer where he himself gives a, a running critique of the city of Jerusalem is first of all, we're critiquing now not Babylon, we're critiquing Jerusalem. We're, critique, we're critiquing the house of God. Judgment begins from the house of the Lord, it says in 1 Peter chapter 4. So it's not Babylon, but Jerusalem. But the critique is not, a, is not just a, the prosperity in the sense of the cultural prosperity of Jerusalem, but rather it's theological or spiritual prosperity. They were rich. Their cup runneth over in terms of the revelation of God to them, God's will, God's commands, God's guidance, God's life, so that they had a theological and, cult and, and uh, 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 spiritual prosperity compared to Babylon. And that is what becomes the focus then in chapter 9 in the prayer, where Daniel says, uh, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets. Well, Israel had prophets. God sent messengers to them. That's a massive advantage over what Babylon had. But the problem was, as Daniel reflected upon their past, is that they had rejected what God had revealed through the prophets. Remember, God for many centuries was revealing his will through Hosea and Amos and Isaiah and Zechariah and Jeremiah. And <clears throat> finally, uh, the, the, uh, they were given you know, uh, final warnings uh, in the time of Josiah in the late 600s BC, uh, before the Babylonians came. And they simply refuse to listen to these prophets, despite having the word of God s surrounding them like oxygen. They simply weren't breathing it in. They were, they were rejecting it. They were refusing it. And then he talks about the city of Jerusalem. Uh, notice the emphasis again. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord. We had his laws. We had his prophets. Here's another reference. All Israel has transgressed your law. We have refused to obey your voice. So you see, as Nebuchadnezzar didn't listen to the warning in the dream about the tree, so Israel was refusing to listen, but not just to one dream, but to endless dreams and visions and commandments and laws. The law of Moses, which was actually written out, they had it in writing, and they still weren't, well, if they were reading it, they weren't listening to it. And we can relate, of course, as uh, Christians. Uh, again, note the emphasis on the city of Jerusalem, what's written in the law of Moses, and how we have not entreated the grace, the favor of the Lord. 
Um, you who brought your people out of the land of Egypt, you see, they, they had no excuse. They had already been rescued from a Gentile uh, kingdom. They'd already known what that was like and how unique God had formed them spiritually and theologically. And yet, for many, many centuries, they neglected God. And, and so Daniel is praying, let your anger and your wrath turn away from the city of Jerusalem. And he's praying this because he knows that they're going to be, uh, that the 70 years of discipline are coming to the end. And so he's, he's praying. Now, notice that Daniel doesn't just assume, since God has set a time limit of 70 years, that he can just sort of fold his arms back, you know, and just sort of, well, you know, God's good. God made the promise, so he has, to pro- he has to come through. So it really doesn't matter what our character is like, our character development over these 70 years. That's not the way he views it. Daniel sees that Israel in captivity in Babylon, under the disciplined hand of God, is still impenitent, is still not repentant. And he doesn't take it for granted that God is just going to automatically deliver them. So he's praying for the nation to repent and to be to entreat the favor of the Lord. And he's asking his face to shine like in number six, the blessing in number six, upon your sanctuary, upon the temple, which of course just lies desolate. Notice this word here, desolate. Uh, and we uh, open your eyes and see our desolations because the city of Jerusalem is in ruins, you know, hundreds of miles away. But this word desolate and desolations is going to come up against very important word, right? Because Jesus is going to reference it in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, the abomination of desolation. And when Gabriel shows up to answer Daniel, he's going to talk a couple of times about desolations. So keep that in mind. Very, very important. The city is living proof as it sits there in ashes, simmering and uh, smoking. <clears throat> Seventy years later, it's still not re- you know, really rebuilt or reoccupied. The temple isn't, re- there's no sacrifices being offered and so on. So Daniel is praying for God to come and deliver them to, for his wrath to end and praying for the nation to repent. All right, now, the next thing we want to do is we want to ask, um, what is the main point in Gabriel's answer? So Gabriel is going to say a lot of little details, and a lot of them are quite controversial, sorry to tell you, very controversial, often referred to as some of the most difficult passage or verses to interpret in all of the Old Testament. But let's not, let's not start with difficulties. Let's start with simplicities. There are many things which are very plainly stated in Gabriel's answer. What's the, sort of the main point of the answer? Right? That's what you're going to be looking at next. What is the main point of the answer? And then how does that main point come back to chapter 4? Again, there's a connection here between chapter 4 and the answer that Gabriel gives in chapter 9. What is that connection? How are the two related? So what's the main point? That's our, that's our big question. What is the main point of Gabriel's answer? Just the main thrust or the simplest way to understand his answer to Daniel's prayer. Best wishes, and we'll see you next time.